Well, here we are. Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm Mitch Ewan, normally at the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. And we're over the hump day. We're Wednesday already. I can't believe how fast these Wednesdays turn over. I'm delighted to have a general, a brigadier general, retired, Stan Osserman, who's actually retiring again today. Number three. Number three. After how many years at HCAT? Six. Was it actually six years? Uh -huh. Wow, did that ever go by fast. So Stan was the uh, executive director at the... Uh, um, Something like that. Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technology, uh, basically focused on hydrogen. So we have two hydrogen nuts or enthusiasts here today, and we're going to be talking to you about hydrogen. So uh, first of all, though, Stan produced this awesome set of videos, two videos, they're animations, they're about two and a half minutes long each. And just to set the scene, I want to show first the first animation, which will tell you all about hydrogen and why it's so great. So roll the first video, please. Hydrogen, the simplest element and also the most abundant. Hydrogen makes up roughly 75% of all mass in the universe. Hydrogen also powers most of the stars in our universe. So it's only fitting that it has come to be recognized as a viable alternative energy source. And we need alternatives because fossil fuels are problematic. They're messy, dirty, expensive to obtain and not secure. And they're limited. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is everywhere. Hydrogen can be produced from a wide variety of sources including water itself, using other renewable energies. That means it's clean, really clean. As a zero emission fuel source, the only byproducts are water, heat, and electricity. Easily transported, hydrogen can be stored and distributed on a large scale as either gas or liquid. As a fuel, hydrogen itself is very light. In fact, hydrogen is 472 times more efficient by weight than lead acid batteries. And it isn't just for transportation. Hydrogen can also effectively produce and store energy for power grids. Hydrogen gas is transformed into energy within a fuel cell. As hydrogen passes through a fuel cell, electrons are released and an electrical current is produced and captured for use. Electric vehicle motors powered by hydrogen fuel cells are twice as efficient as gas or diesel engines. They can travel farther distances than lithium batteries, especially in heavy vehicles, and can last for decades. Hydrogen-powered fuel cells are scalable to buses and commercial fleets such as trucks, trains, ships, and aircraft. Fuel cells allow for fast, easy refueling, and hydrogen can be easily adapted to current refueling stations, making it a convenient fuel source for everyone. It is a proven, safe, clean and efficient energy source currently in use worldwide. Hydrogen is everywhere, including our clean energy future. Okay, now, wasn't that an awesome animation? I mean, well done, Stan, and to the team up at the Manoa Innovation Center that did that. It won an award, didn't it? Yeah, that was actually done by a company called Hyperspective. Yeah. And it won a Pele Award here for animation. Yeah. They actually did three videos for us. They did this one. They did another one I think you're going to show, which I is am. on microgrids. Right. And then a third one, which we don't generally show, but it covers our project that we're doing for the Air Force yeah. called Pearl. And the reason we don't show it is the Air Force wanted their logo on the end. So we sent it forward to get permission to put their logo yeah. on the end. And then the folks who made the video for us said, but our policy changed, so we want to take all this stuff out. And I said, are you going to give it approval? or not. Yeah. And they said, uh, well, it depends. And I go, well, I'm not paying more money to re-edit the stupid video. Right. And then you have me do it again and again, and I run out of money editing videos. So we don't show that one to anybody. But it's also a really good video. Okay. I'd love to see it sometime. Yeah. I haven't seen it, but I, hear, I heard somebody you know, who did see it said it was really great. It so is. It's well, a good video, well done. Too. Yeah. So anyway, that was uh, everything you need to know about hydrogen in two and a half minutes. So that tells the whole story of why it's so great and why we need to be you know, implementing this in Hawaii, and it's uh, also, in my opinion, the key to solving uh, climate change, because when you use hydrogen, you make it from water, just like I said in the video, you do something with it, and then it turns back into water. It's just the perfect cycle, yeah. and why we haven't made, gone after it 
faster and more aggressively is beyond me, but that's what we're going to talk about okay. during this show. But I want to run the second video that uh, uh, um, Stan uh, talked about, which is about microgrids, which is another great technology which is very amenable to hydrogen. So well, the, the transportation world's going to turn electric. Exactly. It's, it's all going to be one big grid and one big electric system. So uh, this microgrid stuff's important too. Yeah, we're all going to be electric and, and hydrogen. More so let's roll the other second video. There are over 300 million people in our country, and the vast majority rely on large-scale, centralized power grids for their energy. But the infrastructure is aging, and it is vulnerable. Natural disasters, cyber attacks, and other threats can leave large swaths of the country without power. Fortunately, there is an alternative. A renewable energy microgrid represents a different path for the future. Renewable microgrids generate power from sources like solar, wind, hydrogen, waste to energy, and geothermal. That power can be stored within the localized system using technologies such as advanced batteries, hydrogen, flywheels, pumped hydro, and others. These microgrids can provide reliable and efficient energy transmission, especially to critical facilities like hospitals, airports, and military bases. Unlike our current large-scale systems, microgrids eliminate single points of failure and are therefore more resilient to disasters, threats, and power outages. Our current energy infrastructure loses a lot of money. Grid outages cost up to $33 billion annually. They are expensive to build, expand, and maintain. And they're inefficient, losing more than half of the initial energy to factors such as line loss, spending reserves, and theft. Microgrids solve these issues and greatly reduce transmission loss and maximize efficiency. They also reduce carbon emissions and eliminate imported fuel costs, keeping money within our local economy, and even create new local industries and jobs based on clean, renewable energy. Our energy grid was built over 100 years ago, when energy needs were simple, with the increased complexities of energy demands, power sources, and transportation. Now our old grid struggled to keep up. We require new ways to generate, store, and deliver energy. Renewable energy microgrids are a potential long-term solution that will provide safe, clean, reliable, and efficient energy for generations to come. Okay, we're back. So now everybody is educated on both hydrogen and on microgrids, which are the two evolving technologies here in the world and particularly in Hawaii. So, yeah, and Hawaii's going to lead the way. Yes. Hawaii's going to lead the way because we have a mandate to be off of fossil fuels by 2045 for our grid. And we have a high pressure to get off of fossil fuels in the transportation sector by about the same time. Right. And so we've got to do this stuff or we're not going to make it. And it's a law. There's a law in the books in Hawaii that we will evolve to a hydrogen economy. So 19610, Hawaii Revised Statute. There you go. So look it up and read it. It's in the law. So we've got to start following the law. So yeah. speaking of that, so <laughs> Stan, where are we with Hawaii and hydrogen? So what's our current status? Actually, there's a lot going on, Mitch. Um, this year, we were pretty successful in the legislature. We had hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are now considered electric vehicles in right. statute. So they're eligible for a lot of the benefits that other electric vehicles have um, in terms of um, tax breaks and HOV lane and right. parking and things like that, which makes it really attractive for people to want to get into the vehicles. Of course, last year, Surfco stood up their station and brought in their Mirai. So we actually right. have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles available to the, to the public. And it's a heck of a deal. Um, yeah, it's like, a great lease. Yeah. It's a really great lease. I would have taken advantage of it, but as you know, I'm moving to the Big Island, right. and the, the lenders who put together the lease package wouldn't let me take the vehicle off island, so I had <laughs> really? to turn it down. But um, it's a, it is a really good deal. Because yeah. you get yeah. your fuel for included. three years, and all your maintenance paid yeah. for. Included. All, all included in the yeah. lease. It was a pretty decent lease, too. Yeah. I was impressed. But there's, there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes that, most people aren't hearing about or it's not making the press, it's not big headlines. Right. But um, a lot going on on the Big Island where hydrogen makes a ton of sense because yeah. you, the distances for transportation just makes sense to have hydrogen fuel cell vehicles yeah. that can go those long ranges without having to recharge. Right. And um, 
the potential for you know all, of, of uh, renewable energies on the Big Island right. to produce you know high volumes of hydrogen. And if you can store that hydrogen in tanks or ammonia or liquid hydrogen, then you can transport it to Oahu and help help Oahu exactly. get renewable faster yes. and get us off off of uh, fossil fuels quicker. And I think people underestimate the impact of the economic impact of coming off fossil fuels. Think of all the money that we send out of our state just to pay for gasoline and diesel fuel and electricity when all the sunlight and wind is falling down out of the sky and blowing right. past us and we could be making so much energy with it and not having to spend all our money and sending it outside. That means jobs in Hawaii, that means a stronger economy, that means so much more tax revenue for the legislature to do good things. Right. Um, it's something we all ought to be really looking at seriously. Well, I looked at the uh, economic multiplier effect. We export six billion dollars right now to pay for fossil fuels, and if you apply the the um, economic multiplier, that's like how many times the money swishes around yeah. in the community. By the time you blend it out, it's worth about twelve billion dollars yeah. worth of economic activity it's here huge. in the state, it's which huge. we're just blowing away every year. You know? And 30% uh, of that just at the, you know, just goes out a tailpipe somewhere yeah. in, in the form of heat, so it's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the only, in fact, you know, you, you asked about, you know, where we're at, and it's, it's funny because if we were all running hydrogen vehicles and doing hydrogen technology now, and somebody came along and said, hey, Mitch, I got this great idea. We're going to drill wells, and we're going to find oil, really cheap. And we're going to pull it out of the ground, and yeah. we're going to put it in pipelines, and we're going to ship it halfway across Alaska. We're going to put it in ships, and we're going to sail the ships to California. And put the oil in a refinery and make gasoline from it and diesel fuel, and then you can drive your cars on that. We look at them like they're from outer space and yeah. go, "Are you kidding me? Why the heck would we do that?" But right now, all the infrastructure for that that equipment, that 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 whole industry is already so huge yeah. to replace it is just monumental, and that's what we're living with, and that's right. why it's so hard to change. We've got so much invested in the fossil right. fuel and, and fossil fuel technology. Yeah. including the automobile companies. It's a sure. lot of money for them to change yeah, exactly. and, and get rid of their engines and go to electric drivetrains. But they're all starting to change now. Uh, mm -hmm. BM, I mean, we, we've got uh, Toyota, Honda, Hyundai. Mm -hmm. all have hydrogen vehicles that they're now leasing. And uh, they just announced a month or so ago, BMW is going to have their uh, hydrogen car out in 2020 or 2021. Yep. It's, uh, you know, we're almost there. And you can bet GM and Ford are right there. They're not yeah. talking much about it, but right. we already know GM's built several Army fuel cell vehicles on right. the tactical side, yeah. and they've got more work going on. Uh, Ford just launched an electric 150 um, a pickup truck, their most uh, famous or popular pickup truck, and they even pulled it out, pulling a train that's over a million pounds. They're pulling this train. Right. And you can bet that fuel cells are right behind that electric sure. truck. Yeah. It'll, it'll be out there. You can, guarantee, you can put money on it. Well, we had the 15 uh, Equinox, uh, GM Equinox vehicles here, the hydrogen right. vehicles. Mm -hmm. They were and, really popular. Yeah, really popular, really successful, great drive, great pickup, the whole nine yards. And we were able to refuel them in under five minutes yeah. Yeah. continuously. So we have a station over mm -hmm. uh, at the Marine Corps base, and you had a station at Hickam. Hickam. And then there's another station up at Schofield. So right. we had three stations, all on military bases, yeah. unfortunately. But, uh, you know, it was just the same experience as anybody would get going into the 7-Eleven and pumping their own gas. You know, all automated. You just touch the screen and say start, and then it would, the computer would take over yeah. and end the fill when they were ready to go. And like I said, there was no fill that went over five minutes. Yeah. So it was and really awesome. Technology. You know what the problem was with those Equinox? The, they were supposed to be brought in and spread around the senior leadership so they yeah. could all ha get exposed to it. But the guys who would get it would like it so much, they wouldn't let it go. So we could move <laughs> it to the other. So all these admirals and generals that were trying to expose yeah. to this technology, they loved it so much, they'd tell their driver, let's keep this car. Right. And the driver's like, oh, you know, he yeah. didn't have any choice. He didn't but, have any choice. But they yeah, did. They the, kept them. The big guy. And so a lot of the exposure we hoped to get out of it never happened because they right. were such good vehicles that they didn't yeah. want to let go of. They're great. Well, we're coming up to our first break. I can't believe we've blown through the first 15 minutes already. So we're going to go on break now, and we'll be right back in one minute's time. So see you in a few, few seconds. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real 
and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the Think Tech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life, and the lives of people around you, tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. So we're back, we're live, and we're talking about our favorite subject, hydrogen, of course. And I've got the guru of hydrogen here, Stan Osserman, uh, who is, uh, we're gonna talk about what are the next steps? We've given everybody a bit of background. You know what hydrogen's all about now, more than we know. And uh, so uh, we've said how great it is. So what do we need to do to pick up the ball and run with it and get it over the goal line? So I've asked Stan to comment on what, what do we need to do this year and next year? So wh what are your thoughts on that, Stan? Well, we actually already started uh, a little bit earlier. Um, this year, like I said, in the legislature, we finally got some momentum and we got mm -hmm. some good traction with some of the folks in the legislature. And uh, in particular, the, the representative from the Big Island, Mark Nakashima, who's now the what, deputy um, speaker. speaker of the House, yeah. um, he, he decided that he wanted to really see the Big Island step out in hydrogen. So he called together a bunch of folks uh, up to uh, you know, the Blue Planet on the Big Island who uh, kind of hosted us and had a meeting. And they asked us for all kinds of input. What, what should we do? What can we do? And uh, we, we gave them some really good suggestions, some things to think about, right. where, to get res where to get resourced within the, the state, um, and where to get funding on the private side, you know, how, we could, how we could get these things going. Yeah. So that's, first of all, that's a huge win right there. We have a lot more backing from the legislature, both House and Senate, than we've ever had in the past. Right. Um, next, they reorganized the state energy office, and they're really focusing a, a piece of, a, a more of it on action versus statistics and policy stuff. Right. And so they want to see the energy office actually make things happen within the state. And they hire a good friend, Maria, from the PUC to go in there and work in the energy office to, to help get that started oh, in really? transportation. And then we've got a lot of private sector people that they just, you know, they call me, I get calls at least once or twice a week where people say, hey, you know, I've heard about this hydrogen stuff and and I got some questions and, you know, I've got, I, I run a warehouse 24 hours a day doing, ha handling food and stuff. Are there hydrogen forklifts? And, and so I tell them, yeah, they're commercially available, plug power, 20,000 of them out in the field across yeah. the U.S. You know, people call about taking their house off the grid or taking their, their, their in, uh, industry off the grid. They have a manufacturing plant here in Hawaii and they want yeah. to take it off the grid. Can you do that or can you at least have a, a, a grid tied thing where you, you can, you know, offset most of your electric bill. Yes, you can do that. And it's, it's building more and more. And I'd say I've never seen in the last six years, in fact, I was doing energy stuff for a few years before that while I was still in uniform. Um, I've never seen the momentum for hydrogen the way it is now at the local level and at the international level and at the, at the federal level across the U.S. Right. So I know last week, um, Dave Molinero from our office, for the very first time took um, the folks from Department of Energy Hydrogen, including Sunita Sachapal, you know her really right. well, took her to the Secretary of the Air Force level meeting to talk to the Air Force about hydrogen. Right. And I can tell you without a, any hesitation that the Army is deep into hydrogen now. They're, they're sold and running down the road. The Navy and the Air Force are starting to figure out this is pretty good stuff, and they're just starting to really get serious about it, but they are getting serious about it. Right. And I see those as huge things, just like the internet. When the military takes off and starts showing people how cool it is, that's when you really get the, the people to understand. So 
You know, there's 330 million people in the United States, and although think tech's a great platform, we don't reach 330 million yeah, people right. regularly. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard for you and I to really push that noodle and, and get oh. it out to the rest of the world. So oh, all you people out there that are seeing us, <laughs> please send this show to all your friends and then ask them you know, that you have uh, emails for. So we can go viral and then have yeah. them send it to all their friends so it's like a nuclear reaction and we get this stuff out there. So that's yeah. the best thing you could possibly do. And you've got two great videos that explain the whole thing. And then you have the hydrogen guru here and uh, explaining some of these things. So please get this out there, out into and the And after you get the state of clean energy out there, then Hawaii Stand the Energy Man, get that one out there too. Yes, that's right. We'll do all of them. We will double team this whole thing. Yeah, Stan has his own show. It's a great show. He's been doing it about five years, six years. Yeah. You have a zillion uh, episodes yep. and he talks a lot about hydrogen. It's very entertaining and it's really good information actually. Thanks. Yeah, I we mean, try and make it really interesting. I sit there and take notes when I watch it. Like <laughs> the guy from Nikolai Motors, oh, yeah. you know, telling us how much a battery charger costs. Like yeah. everybody says, oh, you know, a hydrogen bus is so much more expensive than a diesel bus. Yeah, but, you know, when you buy that uh, or a battery electric bus, you also have to factor in the fact you're buying a battery charger. It can be up to a half a million dollars exactly. if you want to recharge that bus in like two hours, like a fast charge. Yeah. And if you have a fleet of buses, you have to pay for the transformers and substations because there's usually not enough power going to a building to add all those chargers. Yeah, exactly. So you even got chargers. You've got costs outside of your actual chargers. Yeah, exactly. So, and those show up over time. Yeah. You, know, you commit yourself to 20 or 30 buses, and all of a sudden you realize you've got an unseen bill behind the scenes for a whole lot more money. Yeah. In fact, I think the, um, Nikola Motors said, uh, um, Trevor said, it was like, almost the cost of the vehicle for right. the infrastructure. Yeah. So you're literally doubling the cost of the, of the bus. Right. Whereas the hydrogen, you know, once you get the tanks going and you get some kind of source of hydrogen, it scales up really well and the price drops off and drops off. The more vehicles you get, the cheaper it gets to run. Yeah, and also you can uh, contract out the supply of uh, hydrogen. So right. like anybody with a field with three or 400 acres that wants to make hydrogen, you put up a PV array, Make hydrogen, and you get an off-take uh, agreement yeah. from the, the bus company or some other yeah. outfit that's running a fleet of uh, hydrogen vehicles. Yeah, you could do a firm fixed price contract for the transportation energy, right. and those companies would buy it in a heartbeat because the one thing that scares them to death is the fluctuation of fossil fuels. As yeah. soon as there's a crisis anywhere in the world, boom, mm -hmm. price of oil goes, goes up, up. Or, or drops. You can't, you can't tell when to even buy futures or what to do because it's so unpredictable. Right. But hydrogen, you can everybody, plan ahead. Everybody owns hydrogen. Yes. Every country on the planet. We, we might even not have any more wars. You and I are both military guys. Yeah. Maybe we won't have any more wars because what do you fight over if it's not energy? And everybody has hydrogen. Exactly. And how many soldiers wouldn't get killed if you didn't yeah. have to protect a, a exactly. fuel convoy? Exactly. You know, factor that in. You That's, know? We pitch that really hard to the military. Yeah. Other things that we pitch hard to the military are. You know, in fact, our friend Abbas, you know, I, I asked him when, he, when I first started working here, I said, what is it about your technology that the military really wants? And he goes, oh, it's clean and green. And I go, they don't care. The military blows things up and, you know, yeah, they don't right. care. <laughs> and it's expensive, by the way, so it's, it's not clean and green. That, that's not the big selling point. The selling point is it's quiet. It doesn't make any noise. Can you imagine if Honolulu's traffic was like 40% or 50% more quiet? because you don't have engines running yeah. and, and loud, loud mufflers and stuff, it's also not as much heat. So we wouldn't be heating up our cities and things like that. In the military, heat means thermal imaging. It means at night, they can't see where you are. You know? And then you can, you can use this equipment inside enclosed places like freezers or hangars, and you're not killing everybody inside with carbon monoxide. Right. You're just making water. Or, and, or low particulates yeah, that you exactly. know, go right in the, exactly. in the bottom of your lungs. Yeah, so. And then you're, you're treating your veterans after the fact for blown out eardrums from the noise on a flight line and contaminants from the fuel they're, they're right. breathing. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of benefits to this, this technology. Exactly. Um, I want to talk about the uh, Big Island uh, initiative they took this year in the legislature for uh, transportation services contracts. So, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about that? It's, it's a new okay. funding mechanism that's like really awesome and uh, they showed a lot of initiative in getting that through. So why don't we talk about yeah, that then? Yeah, in the, in the 
grid industry, there's a thing called a power purchase agreement where a company could go in, like a solar company can go in, install your solar, um, install maybe some battery backup, and then instead of the customer paying for it all, the customer just pays for their electricity, like they do with the electric company, yep. to pay off the solar. And so it's called a power purchase agreement. And it even happens on a large scale. The electric company can buy solar energy from a big solar farm if a private company owns it. What the legislature did was they applied that same model to government purchased vehicles and infrastructure using renewable energy. So what this allows county and state government to do is to start putting their fleet vehicles out there and getting the infrastructure paid for by the private sector to build the infrastructure, the PV, the, sol the um, hydrogen production, things like that, and battery charges for charge, you know, plug-in electric vehicles. They can pay for that using this power purchase agreement model. And a private investor and private company could come in and do it and then just basically charge the state or the county for, for leasing and renting the, the, the equipment or buying the energy from them. And it's, it's actually really good. It's a, it's a great way to get public-private partnerships going in the state, and that's what's been missing. We right. can't count on the government to pay right. for everything. Yeah. And when there's, a, when there's a financial motive there for for the private sector to, to make some funding, money off of it and create jobs, why aren't we doing it? Yeah, exactly, way? and it, it means that we can replace our uh, infrastructure, our vehicle infrastructure faster, because you've got a bigger pot of money that's funding this whole thing, rather than you know, the government, you know, they have so many competing demands on the, on the treasury, you know, it's hard to mm -hmm. uh, meter it out, but if, if the actual vehicle is paid for by private industry and you're paying just like a service charge, um, then that makes it a much much easier proposition to do it. So that that way we can accelerate the conversion over to our hydrogen yeah. technology, and then everything else grows on that. Because if you have a big fleet of buses, for example, they use a lot of hydrogen, so they're going to be wanting to buy hydrogen, and and so then somebody who has a solar farm is going to be able to have a customer, exactly. and he's going to put in a solar farm. Not only that, this program would potentially allow him to. Uh, uh, use uh, the solar farm as, as uh, part of that uh, uh, transportation services because right, it exactly. includes infrastructure. You know, if you have to build a big garage or maintenance facility, if you have to train your people, workforce development, I'm not sure about that part, but uh, you, know, you pay for a lot of their stuff. And uh, yeah, I think the definitions are pretty flexible. But really, right. you know, hats off to you and HNEI for the work that you guys did with the Helion bus over there, you know, right. the one bus, and then Fortunately, you were able to capture the two volcano buses for Helion also. Right. So, I mean, that's a head start. I mean, the county over there can now start to replace some of their really old, really, I want to say decrepit uh, systems and build a, at least partially public-private partnership uh, fleet that can take better care of the, the folks over there that have to commute from Hilo yeah, to Kona exactly. uh, for work and have it hydrogen fuel cells. So, in one filled swoop, the Big Island could be a beautiful demonstration for the technology on, on an international scale, and also help the county uh, exactly. get much better service for and their, help their our so help our citizens. citizens you know, yeah. especially our low income citizens who absolutely rely on public transportation to get to their job. Exactly. You know, some of them have to walk miles just to get to a bus route. You know, yeah. and not only just replace the existing buses, but add you know make that service yeah. so good that your first choice you'll make is I want, I'm going to take the bus yeah. because you've got enough buses, you can count and on them being there on time, feeder and, system, the whole yeah. nine yards. Marriott bicycle parking and, and, yeah. and things like that. Sure. Exactly. Well, believe it or not, we've blown through our, all our time, 30 minutes already. I believe it. So we're going to bring you back out of retirement. Ha ha ha. <laughs> you'll never retire. Yeah, I know. And uh, we'll do this again. And I have a whole list of other subjects that we haven't even touched okay. on yet. So Stan, thanks so much and uh, congratulations Anytime, and, and enjoy your retirement. Because we're going to enjoy your retirement because <laughs> you're not going to be quite as nailed down by the bureaucracy. Although yeah. I never saw that stop you. so <laughs> I, I always found a way to work around. Yeah. But thanks for having me on the show and thanks for all you do for the state and hydrogen. Right. So signing off, we'll see you next Wednesday uh, for another show. It might be hydrogen, you never know. Aloha.